In this podcast, which I believe will be a series of podcasts with Comrade J.U. of the Real Movement blog, whom you can now mostly find on Twitter at, at damn underscore J.U., we'll be talking about his forthcoming pamphlet he is going to write, tentatively titled either Just Fascism or The Political Economy of Capitalist Breakdown. We discuss a variety of topics ranging from what the starting point of his chapter will comprise of, the importance of MAGA, and even how infrared has shaped a lot of our ideas on resolving capitalist breakdown and overaccumulation, how we've lagged behind MAGA as a movement, MAGA as communism, deficits and hours of labor reduction as critical components to having the most dramatic effects on global capitalism. Mostly, however, this was an open conversation and we hope to refine it as J.U.'s project becomes more fleshed out and we can begin discussing his reconceptualizing of capital. So we're going to be ta- speaking a little bit today about um, a forthcoming uh, pamphlet um, that he's going to sort of expound upon a little bit for us um, on what he's been working on. Um, as I said in my test uh, podcast, um, this is not something that uh, Comrade Jay has ever wanted to, to do. Um, maybe he'll, he'll explain a little bit as to why. Um, we're going to get into at least one of the chapters that he has planned for it. And um, so, yeah, I think it's uh, a good learning opportunity for communists who may not have read some of the uh, the um, Marxist or labor theorists that we're going to be speaking about today, like Henrik Grossman. And I also think it'll give them a, it may be a more refined um, and up to date um, uh, depiction of where we're at, or at least where the starting point is for us as communists um, in terms of strategy, in terms of, of how we conceive of the existing political economy that we live under. And so, um, J.U., uh, what, we talked about this a little bit before, but uh, before I started recording, but uh, what um, what is inspiring you to, or not inspiring you to, <laughs> to uh, uh, write this, uh, reluctantly write this pamphlet? <laughs> Okay, like I said before, I, I didn't intend to write. I didn't intend to, to to write anything. I don't. I don't think that it will convince anybody, and I don't think that 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 it will fill in any gaps or convince anybody of anything. Um, and that if Marx, if Marx couldn't convince them. I, I don't have any, how do you put it, uh, any hope that I can convince people that, oh yeah, I found the magic words here to put down on paper that will convince you that this is what's going on. But I believe that after Engels died, Marx has almost immediately dropped the thread of Marx's argument. When Marx, after Engels died, you get Bernstein, who comes with the idea that capitalism would peacefully evolve into communism. And even Kotsky, who's who's there at the time, was woefully inadequate with his with his presentation of what was going on in Marx's discussion. When you get to Luxembourg, and this is all very sketchy. I'm, I'm not trying to, to be exhaustive. And I haven't read these people exhaustively. I mostly think that they missed the point. So why go over everything that they went in? Mm-hmm. This is very sketchy. There are people who say that wrote that Luxembourg was wrong, but there's something that she is right about. That when capitalists that when she says that capitalism requires expansion into outlying regions of the world market, she's absolutely correct about that. That's how capitalism is compensating for its internal contradictions. That Marx says, 
if these contradictions were left to themselves, capitalism would have collapsed very rapidly, very quickly. And it, to compensate for its internal contradictions, which would bring it to collapse, people always ask the question, will capitalism collapse on its own? Marx says, not only will capitalism collapse on its own, it would have already collapsed on its own if it weren't for these compensating factors that he calls countervailing influences. And one of them was that it would continuously expand into the rest of the world. That is communism. That is this communist tendency inherent in capitalism. Basically, capitalism was creating communism throughout the rest of the world. It was socializing production throughout the world market. And that's how it got over this tendency of its own, its own tendency to uh, collapse. So it's not a question of whether capitalism would collapse. You have all these people that say, oh, you're a catastrophist if you say that capitalism will collapse. In fact, capitalism always inherently tends towards collapse. What stops it from collapsing is it has all these buffers that allows it to do this. And so when, when uh, Grossman criticizes Luxembourg, he kind of misses the point. His criticism is in part correct, but he also misses the point that these buffers is the point, that this is the point of, of, of the book, that capitalism is, through these buffers, it is actually communizing the whole world. That reducing the amount of labor in production, introducing machinery, expanding throughout the world market, is basically what we think of, what we're talking about when we talk about creating the material foundation for communism. That's what capitalism does. And it does this in response to the fall in the rate of profit. And That's what makes chapter 15 so amazing. I mean, it is like, to me, it's like music. When Marx goes through this chapter, he's like, it's like poetry, music. He's like talking about how capitalism does all these things. And he brings in this part and this part, the violins, the cellos, the, you know, whatever. He's like really, discussing how all these parts work together and if capitalism is actually doing these things, it's actually creating the material foundations of a, of a, of a communist society. And there, there are Marx's notes, but there's, it's Engels' writing. So it's the two of them working together, making this description. And really, it's Marx's notes Engels writing and a lot of it is Engels experience because you got to remember he's the one who was actually running a business at the time so he's not conject this is not conjecture for for Engels Engels is actually talking about the business world that he was in so when he says a capitalist never introduces a you know, a new process before, I mean, if, if it will reduce his profit, he, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He's not, he's, he's not speculating. He's not some professor at Chicago school who's coming up with this idea in his head. He's not Anwar Sheikh or that guy from Japan, what's the one, the, the one with the, uh, 
you know the one who, who yeah who, i know what you're talking talking uno unoist or something like that yeah, uh, whatever. Exactly. yeah whatever. he's not those people speculating he's running a business and pulling down big money to run his family's business he knows what he's talking about he knows exactly what what a capitalist will do because he's the capitalist in his family so i mean It, it, it's like the book, the, the whole chapter is, it has his, is not just him thinking about what Marx is saying. It's the two of them collaborating in describing what capital is doing. Using their intellectual genius to describe this whole process and why this whole process, you know, and I really got, and that really, what really came to me was reading Honeycutt's book. Mm -hmm. Because in Honeycutt's book, everybody talked, the Honeycutt, the, the thread that goes through the early part of Honeycutt's book is a selfish system. And people in America hated the selfish system. They hated capitalism. And, you know, you have Benjamin Franklin and all these other founders of the American Republic who were talking about the possibility of free time. Mm -hmm. And that was very important liberty for them. That was more important than property. <clears throat> and they talked about the reestablishment and the, the possibility of, um, how, do, how do you put it, that the Garden of Eden would be restored. And they hated the selfish system. Well, Marx is essentially saying it was the selfish system that was going to create the freedom. Marx identifies the selfish system as the mechanism that would create the free time and not this, this hunger for the return to the Garden of Eden. Right. And it, while I was reading Honeycutt's book, I was like, wow, little did they know that it was the selfish system that was going to create the free time and not this longing for a return to the Garden of Eden. They didn't know that. It was the very thing that they hated that was going to force them to, to have free time. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's this chapter. This chapter is all about the Grundrisse, the 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 the, the um, what do you call it? The uh, fragment on the machine. Yep. And all about chapter fifteen. And how capital is basically that, and it brings us up to the point of breakdown because that's what he talks about. That capital is this historically limited mode of production. Then we begin chapter two, which is breakdown. And which, which uh, Grossman talks about and everybody, and everybody else is talking about breakdown and what happens at, at breakdown and describing what actually takes place at breakdown. And what breakdown really means is a breakdown of money itself. Right production based on money breaks down and why because money itself breaks down and uh, that's the second lesson what that means so then what so is this where you're going to be your, your starting point is basically okay we have these we have chapter of um, 15 and then we have these he's, he's talking about the you know the three cardinal uh you know facts of capitalist production and the establishment of the world market and then we have grossman who's talking about the breakdown um and you know it's a it's, we we discussed this as a, it's a you know a realization problem that the it's capital is running into um but also a, a monetary phenomenon that it's also running into and so where does your where is your work going to start off from? Is it going to be 
um, re like sort of restating this argument first, leading up to Grossman, or is it just going to be starting up from Grossman with the assumption that people of Saudi already have know what we're kind of talking about? <laughs> the first will be a reinterpretation of capital. Okay. The first chapter is a reinterpretation of capital. The capital is not about capital. Um, how do I say that? That the capital is not about how capital works. Correct. Right. It's about this mode of production as a historically limited mode of production that creates the material foundation for capital for communism. Mm -hmm. that that's what the whole thing from beginning to end. That's what Marx's project is. How this this relationship, wage labor, actually creates the material foundation for cap for communism. And go through that whole thing. Um, and very briefly, 2000 words or less. So you're no intent on writing a time labor and social domination esque. No, uh, absolutely. Because yeah. I'm not trying to critique wage labor. I'm just right. trying, I'm trying to show that, that this, what Marx basically says in that one paragraph that he talks about Ricardo, this is what makes Ricardo significant, that he realizes the falling rate of profit. Right. The significance of the falling rate of profit. And why it doesn't fall faster, et cetera. And so exactly. Forth. Right. So that's, that's basically that. Well, I guess with the introduction of this, do you feel that, I mean, it's hard to get, I mean, we don't have any like polling data on this. We can only kind of like see with our eyes on what, how communists think about this. They don't tend, the tendency is sort of that they don't see um, either this way or they see it in, like, as you said, they see it in the first manner of just Marx is writing a systematic um, analysis of how capitalism like intrinsically works rather than he speaks specifically talking about this category of capital, which I think Postone also tries to elaborate on as well. But uh, whereas communists really don't see it as the thing that is building the material requirements for a higher mode of production, which he even directly states um, in, in capital. So I, but so it's, I want, I, I wonder why then it's so like controversial to because because it, it, here's the thing they're not talking they're not none of these people are quoting Bernstein or none of these people are quoting uh, any of the earlier revisionists of Marx so they must be getting this information uh, from somewhere else where uh, you know it's it's very controversial to say something like capital's the revolutionary subject not not the proletariat you know um, or something like that. Because most people don't think that capitalism has a built-in shelf life. Right. That's the thing. They really don't think that that capitalism in and of itself, on its own, is trying to annihilate itself. Mm -hmm. And that it, in the process of annihilating itself, it's creating its own replacement. That the right. process of annihilating itself is creating this thing to replace itself. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't, how, how do you say that? I, I don't, that capitalism is a lobby. Yeah, that, is, that it is working overtime to, to become a butterfly. <laughs> it's it's trying to replace itself with this thing, this communism. Right. right. They don't they don't believe that. That it, that it that it is pregnant with communism, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Social yeah. production is all that is 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 this cancer in commodity production that is trying to consume it and leave afterwards communism mm -hmm. 
it's not communism is not social production social production consumes commodity production but it doesn't become communism right it leaves communism what's communism is the uh, what do you call it it's the transition between production private production carried on separately and this general intellect it creates the general intellect And so it, I, I think I I remember you saying this maybe many 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 years ago that we're we're sort of caught between that right now. Yeah. We're caught bet- we're, we're sort of like stuck between this um, this private uh, production carried uh, excuse me commodity production carried on private and then this latent uh, form of some of, of, of communism in the, in the form of the general intellect and. Um, it just keeps reconstituting itself over and over and over and over and over and over and over again um, in its previous form, like kind of like Post Down says, and 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 um, we're all sort of just expecting um, some uh, like spontaneous revolution to have it realize it, not not realizing that it's already doing it, not that it, that it's already a self replacing system. Um, and um, perhaps this is maybe where Grossman also airs on a little bit, uh, or has um, exactly. uh, where he where he's where he he sort of only formalizes the pro- or problem problematizes it as a uh, as we were discussing before as just a valorization problem that could, if you look on the face of it, could just go on indefinitely. He just says after year thirty six, this is what the state would have to do, or this is what would have to happen to. Uh, labor power, but he doesn't say, oh, and by the way, it also self-destructs even further down down the road. He doesn't go beyond that 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 point. Um, yeah, uh, because he's on that side. He's on the other side where he can't conceive of what actually takes its place. Right. He literally cannot. I mean, it's like you try to conceive of what communism looks like. It's on mm-hmm. the other side of where we are, from where we are. He's on the other side before uh, production based on exchange value breaks down. And he's trying to figure out, well, what does that look like? And he can't, he literally has no ability to think about what that looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, he could sit there and make a rough estimate, but that's all he can do. He doesn't know what society looks like after that. No, and to your point, he he's in uh, the third section, I think, of his book. He really just rehashes Marx's arguments on of uh, uh, the counter uh, veiling uh, or counteracting tendencies, and he sort of just uses that as more of a um, uh, of an argument as to why it could theoretically just go on indefinitely, rather right. than. Rather than this is something that, uh, as you said before, these are actually the tendencies that are trending towards communism itself. Right. Um, that is the communization of the whole world. Right. Um, what what they what they pick up from Bernstein is the idea that if to communism it has to be done by the proletarians right what they drop is the idea that there's any breakdown so people even today pick up the idea that the proletarians and in in place of the moral argument they make the class struggle argument which is a moral argument Mm -hmm. basically it's a moral argument and then they drop the idea that capitalism breaks down and they think that it goes on and somehow it's going to be this thing that merges eventually into communism right but it, there's no they they're very vague about how that happens so it takes 
centuries. Look at right. Yeah, you know, yeah, maybe four hundred years. That I've heard that. Yeah, exactly. it takes four hundred years for it to happen. They they don't see it as something that, boom. There's a there's, there's a catastrophe and we have communism. They they can't even they don't even know what the mechanism for that to to happen is. They don't think that there's a mechanism for it to happen. Well, I guess I mean I I I know you maybe haven't flushed out other parts of the the book uh, or the pamphlet. I'm sorry uh, yet, but um, the rest of it writes itself. The hardest part is this reconceptualizing right. capital. The rest of it right. just I've written so much on the on the rest of it. It's the reconceptualizing capital that's the hard part. Well, I mean, this is something I've tried to do on my own blog. I mean, not to insert myself into this at all, but I've, I've tried to sort of help them understand that capitalism has certain, capital has certain tendencies, right? That right. we, that ultimately, because it's it's always building the, the require, uh, the conditions for communism, that these are things that, I mean, I'm basically just stealing from you, is that these are things that we, we want to exploit. Right, these are tendencies that we want to exploit because if it's already, if it's always inherently trending towards um, breakdown, and like incessantly in t in doing so, even more so now, um, then this this is something that we can only affect through those tendencies. Like we can't impose our own uh, subjectivities on it. We can't impose our own will, so to speak, on it. It's like, um, like I've said, probably dozen times before it's just like it's trying to like like trying to impose your will on like thermodynamics or something it's just not going to it's not going to work it's not like thermodynamics has its own like sort of predestination so to speak and um, has its own sort of inner workings and inner laws and we're always trying to intercede on those things having absolutely no clue how to a how to do that and then like again like why this has to this can't, this can't be its own separate movement right you know and and they and, and so like the if our criticisms have been consistent on anything it's I, and especially yours is that we have all these separate movements independent of how capital is already moving and in and, and the motion of capital and so um i guess that part might write it, I guess, write itself. But like, do you have any thoughts on at least like what we should be doing, or should I mean, definitely, I know you we shouldn't be doing. But like, what do you think that eventually looks like in two thousand twenty three, two thousand twenty four, or just if we ever get to that point of agreement on on on, on the issue? Well, that's where that's where Haas and Infrared have been surprisingly. They've taught me. And I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. They, they've taught me. They made me look at MAGA again through different eyes. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because I hadn't really looked at MAGA this way before. I had looked at Trump and the whole Trump movement, but I hadn't really looked at MAGA. And when they made me stop and look at MAGA and uh, I really began to see that, my God, communism is going to be brought about by people who have <laughs> no idea that they're making communism. Right. I mean, because when you really think about our critique, our critique is this. Basically, capitalism produces absolute overaccumulation. Yep. That absolute overaccumulation is being resolved through state deficits. Yep. Who are the people who hate state deficits more than anybody else in society? This extreme radical right. If these people are anywhere like they say they are, and are hostile to state deficit spending and hostile to state spending at all. Basically, we don't care what they what they want to spend money on. 
If they want to give money to Israel, fine. They can give money to Israel as long as they get rid of the deficit. Right. As long as they curtail government spending. Mm -hmm. Because curtailing government spending is the critical is the critical piece that unwinds the state deficit spending and unwinds the response to absolute overaccumulation and breaks down capitalism. All of that, all of the edifice of labor theory comes down to. How do you stop state deficit? How do you stop state deficits? Mm -hmm. How do you unwind the New Deal, Keynesian style deficit spending? Becomes down, it becomes down to this one simple measure. Can we figure out a way to stop the state from spending, from deficit spending? And who can we get to do that? Right. Everybody else wants more deficits, but there's this one force in the society that says, my God, we got to stop spending deficits because we're going to, because we can't afford it. <laughs> there's only one force that says that and they're anti-communist. Yeah. And, and perhaps maybe even more critically is that they exist in America rather than exactly. somewhere else. They're yeah, not in yeah, they're, they're not in Argentina, although mm -hmm. they are in Argentina. They're not in UK or they're in Germany. They're in Italy. They're in France, but he, but especially they're in the United States. Right. And in right. the United States, they say we can't we can't afford this, and we don't want to mm -hmm. do this anymore. And they want to get rid of the deficits, and every day. They see that we've added another $50 billion to the, to the deficit, and they're absolutely outraged by it. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely outraged by it, and they want it to stop. And, and the whole I, of the global capitalism hinges on their outrage. That's, I have to thank Haas and the guys from MAGA from just forcing me to to say, wow, you know, you're right. These guys are really in a way that I hadn't looked at them before. I mean, I saw MAGA out there and I said, wow, this is some different people. And it's a lot of workers out there. But I didn't realize how critical they were. And that's when I said, MAGA is communism. <laughs> In a yes. way that surprised me the first time it came out of my mouth. I mean, I it came out of my mouth and I was like, did I just say that? Yeah, <laughs> this is MAGA is communism. In a way that I didn't really even understand. And in hindsight, you can sort of trace their genesis a lot like back to probably Reagan era right before the Reagan era. But you can definitely trace them to um, the failures of that administration to reduce deficits, the failures of the Bush yeah. administration to reduce deficits, the failure of Gingrich's compromise with America or compact with America, whatever his bullshit was. Then you have the Bush the second. I mean, exactly. suspending out of his out of his mind, uh, and then Obama drove them just absolutely insane with the same with the same thing. Because remember, a lot of a lot of Trump voters were uh, Obama voters. One and of so, the original, one of the original Tea Party people was on Steve Bannon's show yesterday, hmm. interviewed by him, totally outraged in 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 uh, in uh, nineteen um, two thousand and nine. 2011, when he started doing all this deficit spending, totally outraged. She went out there and started, helped start the first iteration of Tea Party. Yep. Yeah. And George, yeah. George Bush, the senior, became a one term president. Why? Because he lied. He said there were going to be no new taxes. Yep. 
that he would hold the line on deficit spending and there would be no new taxes. Immediately, it blew up into a movement that Ross Perot came, the, the Ross Perot explosion. Mm -hmm. They twice denied Republicans the presidency. 20% mm -hmm. because of hatred for this. This has been the biggest movement in the past 40 years. Yeah, and so again, to also credit infrared and and has like this is I, I, I think we've been I think we've actually been very fair to them in our assessment of not just what they've had to say, but also in we've also been very uh, um, way definitely more than other communist organizations and leftists who really took a critical look at what they were saying and and it really didn't measure up with what especially you have been talking about, but we have been talking about for a decade now, which is the fact that um, there is this, there was this overlooked aspect of society that we were not seeing that, um, that gelled together and fused together with what ultimately labor theory was, was going to be reducible to, which is that this extremely hostile and not only hostile, but unrelenting an unforgiving and uncompromising faction of society, whether they make up a plurality or not, that we're going to go after the state. And they were not only that, I mean, even just today I was reading, they're primarying the fuck out of everyone who doesn't yeah. vote, who doesn't put in a MAGA speaker of the house really or who doesn't right. do anything they want. And so this is, the, and so I think, and I, again, maybe, I mean, my vlogs are a little bit, snarkier about this but what i was really trying to get to the point about maga was is that we don't have to wait 40 years for no. communism they're already a movement that has already been in development for 40 years now and right. the reason because of that is because of their the betrayal of not only not not only losing the presidency in between for a whole for a whole generation for the for the most part but that they re, they finally realized that oh our party is full of fucking shit Oh, they had no intent on doing anything. Now they don't. May, they may, they may not know why Reagan didn't couldn't reduce deficits, and they may not know why George W. Bush had to raise taxes, and they may not know why inflation you know went up in 1990 under George Bush. But it's so like we said before, it's so transparent to them that something is fucked up and rotten in the state of Denmark. That Washington is lying. And Washington, exactly. Washington is just lying out its fucking ass right now. And they can sense this and they don't have to have like this deep theoretical understanding of, of political economy. They live it. Yeah, They live it every single day when they don't have to do anything more than look at their paycheck and go, oh shit, I'm working for the state 40% of the 40% of the week. Exactly. <laughs> you, know? you know where I first met these people? I first met these people in, in, in the 1970s. Hmm. So I have a long history with these people. I first met them in the 1970s when they tried to develop Proposition 2, Proposition 2 and a half. And they were trying to roll back property taxes. Mm -hmm. And I was in the October League, it was going to become the Communist Party Marxist one of us. And I looked at them and they were trying to get property taxes rolled back and everybody in the party was against them. And I was like, why are you against them? It's not your state. Right. And I just could not understand it. I, I would ask them all the time. It's not your state. Why do you, why do you want more taxes? Mm -hmm. And I got overruled all the time on this stuff. I just could not understand. I just could not understand it. Why our people would be in favor of more taxes. Right. But back then, even then, there were these people were pushing this stuff to get rid of the taxes. And it was the Massachusetts Tax Taxpayers Foundation and the Prop Two and a Half people. And so they've been going on almost from the beginning because the first effect of inflation 
is that it raises is it raises all the asset prices. You're right. And when property when house prices rise, so do taxes. Property taxes rise. And so people who own houses, you know, working people who own houses, they were getting killed. They were getting their asses kicked. Like, what the hell? You know, put a limit on this. You know, <laughs> and so this movement took off for this. And they were trying to stop it. They were getting they were getting crushed. Anyway, so communists been missing this for 50 years. This is a movement the communists have been missing for 50 years. And if they had seen it, they would have been out in front. I, I just we just have always missed it. And I think we're congenitally incapable of identifying this. We just picked the wrong part of the gene pool to become communists. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I, I, I think the way I've described it is that we've lived under a lineage of failed, um, like I said, failed movements and identifications of this, of like, in, in some way, these non-communist movements have been so far ahead of us that oh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, like they're so we're lagging behind so badly on all of these issues. Like, like, and again, also to like infrared's credit, like they are also identified. Like, yeah, taxes are fucking bullshit. Like, why would we want to? Like, why would we want to have taxes on wages and labor? Why like, would you, like, you want? Why would you want to pay taxes? Who, who, who says that? Who says that? Is that who, exactly? Who says like more pay, pay taxes? And I like, and especially in Massachusetts, where you know where we live, where it's been known notorious for for this uh, uh, for taxes. It's uh, a particularly thorny issue. Um, I've had to deal with it myself. Where people in like socialist organizations are like, um, we're always voting for these different props to raise uh, their property taxes. And I was always like, you guys are fucking out of your minds. Like you guys are out of literally out of your fucking minds. You want yeah. to raise prop you want to raise your taxes to pay not only that, raise your taxes to to get a government bond that then you're gonna have to pay interest on that shit. And then so you're gonna be paying for two things now. <laughs> so it's like it, it it always boggled my mind that they were for these things because it was always for these like again, these virtue seemingly virtuous things like better school systems or or um, you know whatever whatever their cause celebra is but it's usually for better school systems because I worked in the school systems and I was like how's that going by the way with the better school systems with, the, with raising property exactly. taxes you know how's that going how's the state of education uh, going for you guys right now is it going well uh, because you raise taxes on everybody and it, it never worked out and so like um, yeah we've always been lagging behind on certain issues and um, and sort of, I think, I don't, I don't want to, I, I, I maybe have overstated it before that I said, like, on some level, like, MAGA is our vanguard. But on some level, at least, they kind of are. Uh, There's, whatever you think of them, they're leading the charge against the thing that we should be leading the charge against. We should be, we should have been out front of 40, 50 years ago, Right. But we were we were we were actually the reactionaries on some level, right? Exactly. Because what happened? What happened when uh, Reagan gets elected? All of a sudden, he's he's the, you know literally, you know, evil incarnate. You know, he's gonna he's gonna get rid of the welfare state. It's like, well, good. <laughs> Let him. Did I not write a paper in the Communist Party ML in the CPML? I wrote a paper just said just that, and nobody would listen to me. I mean, when I think of the shit that I was saying and how prescient it is, that I just, it was like people looked at me like I had two heads. And it was that I was just, I had moved down to the South at the time. And so I was being influenced by people who were more socially conservative at the time. Mm -hmm. And they influence me and I influence them. If we had if we had gone in that direction, it'd have been so much better. But we were being influenced by people in Boston and New York and Chicago instead. Who 
just were completely off. They just they just were completely off. Well, one of the uh, papers that you did, or two of the papers that you or you sent me from your blog, sort of talks a little bit of maybe we can talk a little bit about that as well. Is about how like basically how like the day Marxism sort of died. Sort of this is like your sort of uh, of uh, your eulogy for for Marxism. Um, do you think that that had a little bit to do with it, where they were sort of stuck between, oh shit, this welfare state that we sort of inherited from our own failures to address it, you know, when it when it was when it was being in in, in, uh, in its incipient form under 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 FDR, and then when the, the collapse of Bretton Woods ends, and all of a sudden you have all these communists going, oh fuck. Is capitalism ending, or are we over with? Like, what? Like, which one is it? <laughs> what's ending right now? And how do we address it? Like, what's our course of action? What do we? How do we even interpret this? Do we even know what? Where we are right now? Like, it's. It seemed like they were lost from the from the moment that happened. They were just sort of like wandering in the the desert, so to speak. Right. Well. This is this is the period after 1933, right. and, and what occurs here is what hits what what hits me most is that I have no paper trail here, and when I say I have no paper trail, it looks like almost nobody. I I don't see any Marxists who basically notes the fact that every industrialized country after the after the Great Depression went off the gold standard internally. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, France being the last one, I think, in 1936. But I yeah. see no no papers by communists, Marxists during this entire period who say, did you all just notice that all the, all these countries just went off the gold standard? Now, how did that happen? How is it that nobody just noticed that, 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 that took place? And it went, it went by, as far as I can see, it went by without any comment. I don't know if that's the fact that if that is the result of the fact that the common turn existed, the third international existed at the time, mm -hmm. maybe it did. And maybe because the third international failed to notice it, that everybody else failed to notice it. All the parties failed to notice it. They were all in lockstep. You know what I mean? <clears throat> well, uh, I, I can't remember. I might be misremembering this. Um, let's but even in the Soviet, I mean, even in the Soviet Union, Stalin, like Stalin, didn't seem to have any issue with this, like at all. Like he didn't. Like he has a letter to um, H. G. Wells on FDR and um, makes no mention of it. Makes no mention of the impact of it, or makes no mention of the implications of it, even for his own country, or. What would come? What 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 the implications of it were? Uh, so I, I I I'm with you. I've 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 not seen any paperwork that suggests that they noticed it as any anyone noticed it, any of the higher ups or any of the organizations working at the time that noticed it as any sort of. Um, you, get you get people like Hilferding, who's yeah. writing a lot about finance. I don't see any writing about him from him about it. The United States at the time that it went off the gold standard, at, at the time that it withdrew the dollar from peg, a direct, from, I, what, how do I put this? At the time that it outlawed the use of gold right. in monetary transactions inside the inside the country that you could no longer use gold to purchase anything 
They yeah. aggregate the aggregated gold contracts. That's how they phrase it. The ab the aggregation of gold contracts. Right. right. At the same time that they did that, they also devalued the dollar by seventy yep. percent. I didn't see anything about that. Nobody says. Did you just notice that the United States just devalued the dollar by seventy percent? How did, how does that happen? Because if a guy's getting paid five dollars a week, now he is being paid. He's still being paid five dollars a week, but it's only buying seventy percent of that. It's only being worth seventy. It's only worth seventy percent of that. So it's only yeah, worth it, fifty. And it and it doesn't even. I mean, there. Were, I mean, obviously, there were some of the fascist economists who did note it, but so, even some of them immediately dismissed it as a barbaric, you know, relic. Mises, Mises says this. Keynes right. says this. Right, they just dismissed it as part of some sort of evolution within um, exchange and money itself. So it's actually even even people who were um, who did notice it, its disappearance and were even maybe against it initially didn't seem to um, have any significant or feel like it had it was going to have any significant impact on the um, on the economy writ large. So the state does two things. It expropriates the gold of the ruling class, mm -hmm. of the capitalists, and it devalues the wages of the workers. It does them both simultaneously. It attacks both classes. Mm -hmm. If you're getting paid $5 a week, now you're only getting paid $1.50 a week. And the capitalists, all your all your bullion now belongs to us. Anything that you haven't been able to sneak out into Switzerland. Everything that you have down at the first national bank, second national bank or the third national bank in Chicago, all of it belongs to us. Turn it over to the Federal Reserve, turn it over to the United States. It all belongs to us now. They did those both at the same time. They attacked both classes. Yep. That's undoubtedly. That's undoubted. Nobody can even nobody can even pretend that that did not happen. Yet I don't see anybody saying anything about that. Both classes simultaneously attacked on the same day. Well, what they say is that they did it on, on behalf of one class over the other. That's what they say. I don't see how taking the, the gold of the bourgeoisie is on behalf of the bourgeoisie. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I, I agree. I agree with you. I'm just saying, but that's usually the that's usually the, the the default answer is like, well, they did they didn't actually expropriate the expropriators. Um, what you, what they did is they entered into this compact with them, which is not, by the way, how the cla that class saw it. Um, I, I again, I could be misremembering this, but in the in the because you know the, the original go contracts uh, abrogation of go contracts had to go to had to go to the Supreme Court, right? Right. And they were contending that this was the end of private property as we know it. That's what they were sure. contending. Do you in, have that? Yes. Do you have? Do yeah. you have that? I have. Yeah, I'll have to find it for you. So um, send that to me. But, yeah, I'll have to find it for you because that, that's what I was re reading that, and I go, oh shit! As like they were already making the case that this was the end of private property. Right, because it's 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 um I forgot what year because the, the the Gold Reserve Act is passed in 1934. I can't remember right. how long it took them to get to the point where it was federally mandated. Because um, you know they did Executive Order 6022 or whatever in 30 Yeah, six. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, and they did it. Yeah, yeah, they did it in um, 20, uh, 31 or two or three or something. Like, I can't remember. But that was uh, original. Uh, part of that was originally considered uh, illegal. And then they, but if you read the court, some of the courts um, summaries on this, they were, they were, the, the, um, the plaintiffs were definitely making the case that this is the end of 
private property as we know it. It was also the case, some of the cases I think some of the economists were making uh, this and that's and um, so it, it's it's it exists. I don't think it maybe exists in the the form we think of it as, but it, it definitely exists. Like they were never they weren't thinking that oh god the capitalist class is being expropriated by the state, but that seems to be the argument they were making in court. Um, yeah, that that's the one I want. Yeah, Legal. yeah, that basically. Yeah, basically private contracts now between people are it's over right you can't promise a certain amount of gold at one date and then repay it at some other you know uh, wait another date and they're saying that basically ends private property and print in the contracts between people uh so that's 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 kind of what they were arguing in in these cases oh so, yeah i'll look it up for you i just i have to find it uh, uh, again there but um but but yeah so that that was a um a watershed moment for uh, for um, for Marxism and communists and labor theory because, um, but it also does, and uh, I, I'm sure you feel the same way. But this does this confirms what Engels was talking about, right? Right. That that the state is now taking over everything. They become the national capitalists, not in the in the nineteenth century way, where they're just taking over you know nationalizing this industry or nationalizing this industry exactly. they are taking over the entire motor production almost, almost overnight a flick of a pen um some legal battles in between but for the most part they did it within a couple of a couple when of you calendar money you own the entire motor production exactly right and so i think this is what's probably maybe one of the more controversial things that and it shouldn't be for some reason, but it's one of the more controversial things that you, you talk about only because um, it would appear that then there's nothing, there's no class to overthrow, right? Exactly. They've already, right? And so it's really... No class it, to overthrow. Right. It's, and then it really reduces its... And then when you talk about the proletarian class, then you're talking about the same thing what they're talking about in the German ideology is overthrowing labor is the same thing as overthrowing the state at this point right and so these are things that i don't know why they're so controversial and i and i don't maybe maybe we're seeing it through a different lens than everyone else and maybe we're it's exactly the point exactly what is that what why, why is that where, where does that come from i don't know i've I, i've i've really tried to um people just explain it as like um I, I even retweeted someone because they had said something along the lines of, let me, what did they say? They said, Marxism cannot be saved because everyone learns it at different plateaus. Um, and then he just goes on some other ex explanation. And then and, they, and everyone thinks they have the correct um, reading of it or they have the correct theoretical interpretation and True stuff like that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah, they're, yeah, exactly. They're all triviality. So it's like, but... Um, I don't know if that properly explains it or not. Um, I don't because that, that's a, that's a, that's something I've heard for a very long time. That it's, yeah, the CIA would love to trivialize the differences. That, that, right, that wouldn't be a good approach. So um, I'm not entirely sure what the reasoning is for it, other than because remember we're part of a very small group of people who probably accept this as not canon i don't want to go that far into uh saying that like we're speaking gospel here but 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 to the point where this is the way that we problematize the last 90 years of the crisis right, right. Uh, rather than again on something a little bit more vague that maybe we've criticized other people on about just reducing it to finance capital or monopoly capital or still that we exist in this realm of imperialism or something like that so it's it's when you get down to like what's specific about fascism that is that's different than what everyone else is talking about i think and and but again it doesn't explain why we think this way and what i how what i why everyone else does doesn't um what what is interesting to me maybe is maybe you and this is why we've sort of focused on libertarian is that libertarian party starts when they start the exact year the gold standard ends right in 71 oh, right yeah, yeah the, the libertarian party starts in 1971 so they sort of had an inkling maybe even before we did uh by i mean 
communists and Marxists did that something is off. Something has changed fundamentally within the economy. Um, I think I've mentioned this before that um, during there's a, there's a good book. I, I forgot what it's called. It's called like Three Days in Camp David or something like that. And it's about the um, Nixon's decision to go off the gold standard and how much of a real dilemma that was for him because he they understood how it was going to change everything because they couldn't understand how the economy was functioning anymore right is it you have, let me, what's let me, that is is it this is real what's real three days the, the, yeah let me uh find the name of the book if i can um uh, not to waste air time but um uh, do 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 uh, yeah, three days at Camp David, how a secret meeting in 1971 transformed the global economy by Jeffrey Garton. It was something that was like phenomenally speaking, like happening within the economy that um, they were not understanding. Like they didn't, like all of his um, economic advisors are on record saying that we have no clue what this, what's going to happen when we do this really in right. reality. And they are, and like you have people like Paul Volcker saying like, um, um, nobody's in control, which is a very Marxist thing to say, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> that was, like cap, capital is in the driver's seat, not us anymore right now. He was he was a supreme pragmatist. Yeah. So um, to him, you just fix the problem in front of you. That's all you do. Right. They have so, Friedman in there. Um, they might. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I've, I've heard rumors that Milton Friedman's argument was that uh, if you if you if you uh, severed the dollar from gold, that that gold would drop. The price of gold would drop to a base metal. Well, uh, if he did, I'm sure he, if he did say that, I'm sure he tried to get rid of that statement. Oh, he, yeah, he, he was a stupid ass. He, he was just the stupidest, dumbest. I don't know how he got the, uh, the, the economics prize because he was just the dumbest possible person. Yeah, I think. I'm, I think he wrote a blog saying like uh, on him once saying something along the lines of like you you regretted having to share like the planet with him for however long yeah. <laughs> <laughs> however long he was uh, on here for because of um, his takes on monetarism and whatnot so but um, let's see um, what was the other paper that you had sent me? Um, I think it was basically the same thing. It was the gold after the death of Marxism um, and about George Gafentis, um, if I'm saying his name correctly. Um, I think we kind of pretty much covered most of that. Um, yeah, that's my second, but that's the, um, that's the, that's app. That's the second chapter. Okay. Okay, that's going to be your so your second chapter then. Okay. Yeah, which is basically uh, explaining the separation of gold and the dollar, um, and why that why the breakdown of production based on exchange value appears in the form of the separation of gold and the dollar. Mm -hmm. And do you have any oh, insights? It really, into it? it really isn't. That's right. only the phenomenal expression of it. In reality, it's like this incredible crisis. crisis where it's really very funny. But how do, I, how do, how do I do say this? It's a crisis that spreads throughout the economy 
that appears as on the surface of the society as a separation of gold on the one hand and dollar prices on the other. Mm -hmm. But you can see it in gold. You can see the crisis in gold. And, wh and why do you think like other um, labor theorists or other Marxists have sort of just ignored this, um, what should be relatively obvious and straightforward is the fact that there is this huge divergence between constant dollars and and gold when you start when you start when you start measuring things like socially necessary labor time what are they what are they stupid what? okay well i used to think that they were all stupid i used to think that they were all uneducated but then yeah. why why is every reporter at a major um newspaper um pro-israel and on the same sheet of music when it comes to Ukraine. Right. Why is everybody in Congress within a matter of hours all on the same sheet of music when it comes to the, the bombing of a hospital in Gaza? I don't think it's too much I don't think it's too much to to argue that the same process is at work among all the people who we consider notable academics, notable Marxist academics. Right. They're all on the same payroll. Well, Stone was one of those people who said that labor was the problem, but he never could turn it into a program. And it just, it, it's always bothered me that it, it always goes to that point and no one has ever been able to turn it into a practical program. And I don't understand why that is. I guess by, by practical program, if we want to talk about like also the, um, the other theorists as well who fall into sort of this camp of not being able to um, come up with a program independent of because of just like ranked politics or something like that or quote unquote communist politics like Badiou said or something. Um, what do you think that kind of looks like that because I've my understanding is that like to come up with a program per se is always going to be in the negatory sense. Not go, it's never going to look like a, we're going to establish X, Y, and Z, and it's, it's rather, it's going to be, we're going to be moving against our own activity. We're going to be moving against the very thing that's sustaining, we think, our own, our live, our livelihoods. We're going to be moving against the thing that we think that, oh my God, my grandmother, uh, she relies on for, you know, social security. Come out and said that the button, that the federal budget should be balanced. Right. But then I guess they, the argument would could be made then that like, um, all right, how do we do this? I mean, I've suggested that like, okay, in, and, I'm, I'm, and, and I'm really just taking some of your lead here is that all these communist organizations throughout the country, and there's probably a myriad of them that we don't even know about, um, they have to just dissolve themselves. That's like, the, like that has to be the, the bare minimum starting point is they have to stop doing what they're doing because they're all antagonistic um, towards that end on the face of it, whether they have that in their program or not. And they have to join the one movement that is at least um, <laughs> the most, uh, at least vociferous about it, right? The most, the most boisterous about it, the most active about it in, uh, in it. And I don't think, I don't know if that's something communists are willing to do is with to join something rather than, we're going to start something or we're going to build something or we're going to change these people's minds on, on the problem or the issue. Um, I don't, I, I, I think I looked at the PSL program. 
I, they, yeah. they need to throw that program out. Of course. And uh, it's a single thing at the top. The federal budget needs to be balanced and hours of work need to be reduced. And wherever, what, however that takes in a practical sense, that's what they need to do, wherever they are. I don't know where they are. I assume they're in Brooklyn somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't know either. Where, they, where, where exactly they work. Uh, but I would probably be, um, I think that that would probably be best for them. And they should join MAGA and create a program, create an organization. MAGA is not a single organization. Right. It's, it's a, it's a, what do you call it? It's a concept. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different organizations that do it. There's some guy out in Arizona, I believe, who started what he called the uh, precinct project. Well, their job is just to get people to sign up to become Republican to take over Republican offices mm -hmm. and defunct precinct chairs all yep. across the country. He's identified them. You could join that and, and become mem become members of precinct offices in all these defunct areas like Massachusetts and just become a def just become a precinct worker. Mm -hmm and get elected there and fight to get the get people elected to Repub get people elected on a MAGA program to uh, state office or to to federal office or whatever whatever these organizations do but with the idea that ultimately to balance the federal budget there are other people who do school stuff. Fight to reduce, to, to get the government out of schools. You know, government should not be running schools. Right. So there are lots of things that people can do. Um, but they're practical things that they should be doing. Not... Um, not fighting for national health care. Government should be out of the health care system. Completely. Correct. Completely. Yeah. There's nothing that government can do that helps health care. Just get them out of it completely. But I don't know whether they do that. If they dissolve themselves as organizations, if they don't dissolve themselves as organizations, they can do things like... Uh, like that guy Major down in uh down in Philadelphia. Uh Mosh Mosh Trey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he does uh education on gun gun safety and gun use and promotes gun gun ownership in the black community. Why 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 can't you do something like that? Second Amendment. Well, well, I always, I but well, I also wondered then, like, why couldn't you do something like, um, like take like uh, Vivek Ramaswamy's uh, plan and also teach that to people? Like, that would be the easiest no-brainer of all time. You just steal it, like you don't right. have to do anything, you know? Like, exactly. make, make make a make a PowerPoint and then distribute it and say this is what we this is what we want to do and attempt to do, but also explain it from our point of view and what we think it, it accomplished. We don't have to say like, oh, it's going to lead to communism. Like, I don't think anyone would care to hear that, but like they we could at least say like, this is what we think um, uh, possibly that you could, it could lead to a shorter work week. It could lead to obviously prices going down or something like that. It would get government out of certain aspects of the economy that we don't want them in that are you know, definitely would curb inflation, et cetera, and so forth. And these are all things that would, um, and you don't even have to fire people. You, you could just right. reduce the work, reduce their work week, mm -hmm. which would be even better than than um, firing people. 
He wants to fire people. You don't have to fire people. You know, what if everybody in federal government and everybody who worked for corporations that work for federal government, that all their work weeks were reduced, like uh, General Grant did in the 1880s. Yep. Mm -hmm. Call it the Grant Plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think I believe he was one of the first people. I think he was the first president to do that, correct? Right? He was the yeah, first president. He was. He was. After the, the Civil War. Yeah, we, I think we've had this conversation where every time a Republican shortens the work week, a Democrat reverses Democrat the trend. Behind him and, and lengthens it again. And, and lengthens it again. Yeah. Yeah. And they use, yeah, they use some, they use some, they use some yeah. uh, pretense like, like Wilson, like well, I think Wilson did the, the same thing during uh, the First World War. Communists um, could get together a, a group to restore the um, 1968 platform. For a thirty-two hour work week, for a thirty hour work week. It's yeah. That party. Well part of my part of my project going forward is to sort of re link the um thread between conservatism or republicanism, however you want to call it, and their history of actually being for shorter hours. Exactly. You know, being, and then so and there's a lot of there is a, a ton of data out there and a lot of it's in their platforms and I'm going through their speeches and you can find some of their senators even talking about it. People who weren't president, for example, who um, were talking about these things. So it's it's um, yeah, there's a lot of things out there that we can be doing uh, about talking about the short work week or balancing the budget. And so. Communists could do this inside the MAGA movement. And yes. they could do it openly. They could do it openly mm -hmm. if they wanted to. Um, they, as communists, yes, I'm in the MAGA movement. And yes, I'm a communist. And while I, just, I don't agree with everything, and you may not agree with me with everything, this is something Republicans have always stood for. Yes. That is what I I, I, I kind of wish um, um, Jackson Hinkle would, would maybe emphasize a little bit more over some of the other things, like and I, he can do whatever he wants. He's yeah. He's, Republicans aren't aren't that New Deal shit. They they're not that New Deal shit. They're not that yeah. green green New Deal shit that, that that these people are talking about. Well, Jack is not talking about a Green New Deal, but it, 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 within the, if you look at like the MAGA communism platform, it is a version of the New Deal that. Yeah, uh, that's, that's not so, that's not Republicans. Republicans. That's hated, not Republican. Yeah, yeah, they hated the New Deal. I, I believe they like his positions on like you know being America first and et cetera and so forth. I mean, I'm sure that that's appealing to them, but also right. like to rekindle the thread of balancing the budget, getting rid of these fucking deficits, and and reducing the work week and reintroducing them to the like to the concept that this is actually your heritage. Your heritage actually lies in the fact that they wanted to make the economy more efficient, and they they exactly. knew that there is a, there is a way to do that. <clears throat> one of the one of the ways was shorter work week, and the other one of the days one of the ways was um, is that they what? had to. Oh no, go ahead. I'm sorry. One of the first political um, one of the first political. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, speeches that Dwight Eisenhower made was that military spending was inflationary. He made that in 1950 when he first started running for office. He made the argument that, 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 that 1950, no, 1952. In September of 1952, Dwight Eisenhower argued against the, the Cold War, saying that at first it was that military spending was not did not show American strength, it showed a failure of foreign policy, and that it was that that failure was inflationary. The more the military that they had to maintain, the United States had to maintain, the more uh, the more inflation was and this is when inflation in the in the american economy was like one percent he was mm -hmm. saying 
that that inflation was the result of military spending. He already had put the two and two together to come up with this is this is why we have inflation because of the military spending. He had already figured this out. Um, so you can you can there are people the the post war Republicans who clearly understood the connection. And that's also the the, the argument that Goldwater made mm. against Johnson's Great Society. Yeah. Nixon, that's, that's I don't a, know what happened to him. I, I, just, I just don't know why he went off the reservation so badly. Um. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I've been trying to I've been trying to figure out that myself because, as you know, like he gives he was you know he was Eisenhower's um, VP. And he gives this great speech at 56 on unleashing the productive forces on a four day work week on technological advances and automation and leisure and stuff like that. And how that could be used in its own right to increase uh, productivity and whatnot. And then uh, 12 years later, he's he's a uh, Keynesian. He, yeah, he's we're a Keynesian. Keynesian. Yeah, we're, we're all Keynesianism now. And it's, it's um, so it's. Um, but that was kind of, that seemed like that was more imposed on him rather than uh, yeah he was like, he was admitting failure right. he was like we was like well when it came to when I came face to face with a with a with a crisis I didn't have the balls <laughs> to actually reduce the work week <laughs> That's right but it, what he was saying right and I think that only maybe goes to our point a little bit the idea that given the choice, like given the choice directly to the state to do something like reduce the work week or just keep doing Keynesianism bullshit policies, they're always going to choose the latter. They will always choose the latter. It's not something we like. We literally have to force them to do the opposite or find some, some, some way that's compatible in, in where the latter, where the latter is also impossible. Right. And so like, um, and that has been a thread, a constant thread um, since the collapse. Um, certainly in the past 40 years. Yeah, certainly. Yes. And certainly in the past That's 40 years. That's why you've had different reiterations of the same movement that's come up again and again to try to balance the budget. Before yeah. This is what, the same iteration. Yeah. That's what I talked about a little bit about Mike Termont about where I, where I was like, I told him that the most popular um, um, amendment introduced in on every with like by leaps and bounds is a balanced budget amendment, um, and this wasn't just a, even a Republican phenomenon. This was the, the the leading issue in the '90s for Democrats was also a smaller government. Fifty five percent wanted a smaller government. Right. Of Democrats. Democrats. We're talking Democrats. Yeah. You know, and the Democratic voters. We're not just talking about, you know, pre Tea Party people or or fiscal conservatives. We're talking about people who also wanted was it was affecting this beginning to affect them. Um so it 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 it, it, it also did follow a um there also did seem to be some cogency between the two um parties at least um on that issue uh for a brief period of time anyways and, yeah i think you could get probably a 60 70 percent yeah and i got, I got and it Majority. was the lead and it's and it was the leading issue this year for for the debt ceiling yeah during the time they everyone wanted everyone said we know we need to stop sp spending you know out of our asses and we need to stop spending you know sending money here and there in ukraine or whatever and um there was there was a pretty pretty solid consensus in america that um the time for for you know getting social spending under control was um well now <laughs> you know 40 years ago not just now 40 years ago so um is there anything you'd like to conclude in saying maybe about um do your book or your upcoming pamphlet that you haven't said for right now I need to spend so much, some more time on uh, chapter one. I hope to have it done by the next time we talk. 
Are you going to uh, post it as you go along, or are you just going to uh, release it like all at once as a kind of a? What do you think I should do? What do you think? It's a good question. I'm going to be uh, for my blog. I'm going to be releasing just like ex ex excerpts of like what I my project, um, but I don't know. Yours is a little bit long. Going to be probably even longer than mine. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. two thousand two thousand words a clip. So, um, and it depends on what you want out of it. Do you want feedback on it or do you want it to, to uh, just be something that you want people that know that's happening? Like, so it's like, um, I don't do, know. Maybe we'll do it a chapter at a time. Yeah, a chapter at a time might, might be good just for uh, like a serialization of it, you know? Yeah. Like they used to do old serials and magazines or something like that. I so, Mark um, tried to do capital. No, he tried to do um, wage labor and cap, wage labor and uh, profit. Right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe when he was working for that, um, the uh, the newspaper he was at, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ju, it was uh, always good talking to you. Um, uh, I look forward to reading this, as I always looked forward to reading your blog. I'm happy you're writing something, even though. For some reason, we're both agreeing that it's not going to fucking lead to anything. For some reason, I don't know why we're conceding that point so quickly, but um, I, I I hold out some optimism that people will read it and they will um, change some of their perspective on it. But um, thanks for coming on and talking. Uh, if you want to come back on and talk again, let me know. And um, yeah, we can do it so, in a month. How's that sound? Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. We can uh, see where you've uh, you've, you've updated, made, made any updates or made any um, progress on um, your writing, and uh, I can give updates on if I made any progress as well.